Uh, my name is John Wigley. I work Hi, at FP John. Complete doing Haskell programming. How long have you been a Haskell programmer? I've been a Haskell programmer now for a little over one year. Okay, well, what brought you to Haskell? I think it was just that I saw a lot of buzz around Haskell. I had friends who were using it, so I knew of it maybe five, six years ago. But every time I looked at it, I wasn't, didn't find it very appealing just from the surface. Looking at it, the syntax appeared a little too complicated. It seemed difficult to learn and that there weren't a lot of people using it. But as the years went by, it seemed that there was a growing interest. So I thought, well, what is in this language that makes people so interested in it? Um, and I gave it a couple attempts to learn it and failed at them because I was put off by a lot of the mathematical terminology, a lot of the, uh, the computer science I just didn't know or need to know from other languages I had learned. But I made another, I made a, a few attempts. So by the third attempt, finally I sort of, I cracked this nut that I was trying hard to gnaw on for those few years. And when it finally all dawned on me how simple Haskell was at its core, and the, the solutions to current modern hardware problems that functional languages offered, especially in the area of multi-core programming, I just got very, very interested in it. And I thought, this is the future. I had been a C programmer for decades, maybe 22, 23 years doing C programming, uh, mostly writing C++ compilers, even though I didn't use the C++ language itself all that much. And I just saw what those languages the sort of ways they let you shoot yourself in the foot and having shot myself in the foot so many times that I'm now just stumpy, I saw that Haskell eliminates some of those problems like uninitialized variables. They just can't exist in Haskell. They don't have any meaning. Um, and I thought this is a language I just want to be involved in more. So I sort of dove into it and when I saw the, the, that Aaron was interested in an engineer for, for FP Complete, I said to him, I may not have been a Haskell programmer for very long, but I'm a compiler engineer of a long time, and, and maybe there's something I can still offer to you. And so he said, okay, come on. And I've been learning Haskell in sort of a trial by fire since then. Very cool. Okay. Um, so you use Haskell now every day? Mm -hmm. Actually, every it's day the right? only language that I use. Okay. Do you use it in conjunction with other languages? Like You say it's the only language, but... One of the things that we find with Haskell is that it can work well with other languages as an add-on. Um, I don't anymore. I used to use Python for all of my system scripting and C++ and C for the, the applications that I really wasn't concerned about performance or efficiency. And now I find that Haskell works equally well on both types of programming. So I, in the last year, I actually have not written any code in any other language. And I don't necessarily think that that's what people have to do, but I have just found for the types of programs I want, I want to write, I get the efficiency and speed in the area where I used to use C, but with improved correctness. And then in the area of Python, there are enough libraries in Haskell for doing system scripting that I also get a lot of the uh, flexibility and ease of coding that I had with Python, but again, with the correctness. So having a program that after it compiles, it stands a good chance of being correct is a very valuable property. Even if it takes me a little longer to write the code itself, I'd say over a Python script, it might take me twice as long to write the actual program and get it to compile in Haskell. But then the distance between having it compile and being done with it and being able to move on to the next bit of coding is a much, much shorter time frame. And those programs tend to work for a long time. In fact, one of the things that really sold me on Haskell and why I came back to it uh, so many times is that the very, very first program in Haskell I ever wrote, which was about three years ago, was this program that just takes any archived bundle and unarchives all the files that are inside of it. And it does so recursively. So if you have an ISO image with a compressed tarball inside of it, and in that tarball there's another compressed file, it'll just keep unwrapping layers until it gets you to that file on the bottom. Well, I wrote that program. It was difficult to do, of course, because it was my first Haskell program. But after I got it working, it has worked ever since. I don't know that I've actually ever made any bug fixes to that program, and I use it on a nearly daily basis for the last three years. So I always had in the back of my mind that Haskell was this language that let me produce a program that worked after I was done writing it and never needed updating. And I've rarely had that experience with other languages. Could you tell me a little bit more about the types of programs you're writing with Haskell? Um, what kind of business problems you're solving? Well, I, wor I work on the back end of our web 
offerings at FP Complete. So when you go into the IDE or into the tutorials and you click the run button and you want to see the code run, there's something that sits on our servers between GHC and the user's front end code. I mean, the, the, the user's browser that talks to GHC, submits the code, gets the compilation results, hands them back. Um, I, I work on that code. So it's, it's all, it needs to be performant. It's highly asynchronous. I use a lot of um, uh, Haskell's asynchronicity libraries like async and STM uh, to do that work. So that's the main type of coding that I do. I also work on a library that interacts, lets you interact with Git repositories in a programmatic way and pull code and software out of them. And our backend uses that to store the things that people write into Amazon S3. And that's where I spend most of the time writing Haskell. I also have some personal projects that I do, just mostly system maintenance, scripting, and things like that, which I write in Haskell. Okay. Um, before coming to FP Complete, what were you using Haskell for? Uh, I wasn't using Haskell. I had, that, oh, okay. I had that unarchiver program, and I had started writing the Git library. I think I was about a month and a half into the Git library as sort of my first real foray into something serious for Haskell. And then when I started FP Complete, it just really worked out nicely that I was able to simply start working on that library for them. Great. So you talked a little bit about um, what brought you to Haskell. Could you talk about the learning curve, um, your experience with starting to learn Haskell and you know what, what those steps were? I found the learning curve uh, pretty brutal. It, it, it was pretty. Uh, it was pretty much a vertical ascent for me because I come from a background of not knowing math at all, not even liking math. Uh, not very strong on computer science because I studied philosophy at university. I didn't study computer science there. And a lot of the things that I knew about programming, I had just picked up from either books or reading blog articles or, or writing code myself. So I was pretty solid on, for example, working on compilers and writing parsers and that sort of thing. But I didn't know about uh, graph theory. I didn't know about uh, a lot of the more arcane data structures that are out there and some of the fundamental abstractions that Haskell is based on, like the algebraic concept of a monoid, for example. I'd never even heard of it. So coming into Haskell was basically this brand new field of terminology. I didn't know what functional programming meant. I didn't know what the lambda calculus was. And everyone that I talked to who was talking about Haskell was using these terms as if they were understood by everyone what they meant. I remember even getting a little bit irritated reading some Haskell blog posts because I felt like they were written for people who already understood what they were trying to say. You know, it, it took a while before I realized that no, actually they are, they are continuing the dialogue. It just seemed that way to me from the outside. So it was hard. It was hard going. I had to ask a lot of people a lot of questions, especially on the IRC channel. What does this mean? What does that mean? Um, but after, after keeping at it for several months and, with, and the very, very helpful nature of a lot of the people in the Haskell community, then finally I got that core vocabulary down, which then made a lot of the rest of it easier to understand and read. So what advice would you give to somebody who was like you maybe, who was interested in Haskell and wanted to learn more. What, what advice would you give them to get started and to become proficient with Haskell? I would say don't try to bite it all off at once. Uh, the, the community will throw a lot of terms at you that, are, of course, have become famous uh, about their complexity, like functors and monads and all these other types of ideas. Just put those on the side for the, for the moment. Start very simple with the pure core functional language. Um, there's a great tutorial on the web, Learn You a Haskell. Uh, that's where I usually send people. And that, if you just start with the simple core, you, that I think will introduce you to how simple Haskell is at its base. That a lot of what seems complex in Haskell are actually just functions that people have written, libraries that people have added to the language. If you took away all of the libraries and you sort of just got to the core syntax that Haskell itself provides you when nothing else is there, it's incredibly small. It's not very hard to understand. So uh, much of the complexity, get, you can translate it down to how functions get combined. Okay. Um, from a business perspective, where do you see Haskell having the biggest impact? I see it having the biggest impact in maintainability of code. Like I said, when you write the code, it's harder to write. But when you're done writing it and it compiles, it's closer to fully correct. Of course, there will be runtime bugs still that you need to track down and fix, but there will be few of them. Um, you'll still need to write tests, but you have less of a reliance on them. And as you use Haskell more, you, you sort of develop this technique of 
moving more and more of your invariants into the type system so that they become compile errors rather than runtime errors. So if you come back to a system three months later, for example, and maybe you're not the person who wrote the system, but you need to add some feature to it, adding the feature will break the code in such a way that correcting the breakness will get you back to the code running. Um, if you don't have that property, if you have a language that is much more liberal in what it lets you do to the code and still get it to compile, you can make a change and not realize that you violated many of the invariants that the original developer of the code had intended. And now it seems to run, but then a couple weeks down the road, something will just completely blow up because you forgot this and you forgot that. And what Haskell's doing for you co at compile time is, whoa, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. If you get a compile error in Haskell, it's worth figuring out what it means because it's telling you that what you think the code uh, means is wrong. You know, it, it, it's basically guiding you toward the, a correct understanding of what everything is supposed to uh, come out to be. And then as well, not just maintainability, but I like the way Haskell works with modern hardware. Uh, we have a lot of dependency now on things like multi-core, uh, cache locality, um, a lot of really low-level operational things that in, in languages that are more recipe languages, as I kind of call them, like in C, it's, it's more of like an assembly language where it's a recipe where you're telling the computer what to do. I want you to do this and then do this and then do this and then do this. Well, in order for, in order for, the, for that program to compile into something which t makes the best use of modern hardware, you have to give it the proper set of instructions. You have to give it the set of instructions that best suits the way, for example, uh, the Haswell processor from Intel is going to want to execute the code. In Haskell, it's completely different. In Haskell, you describe the program in terms of what things mean. I have this value, and transforming it into this other value means this. And then the compiler's job is to translate that meaning into a set of instructions. And that translation can differ depending on what computing architecture it's destined for. So, for example, in Haskell, there's a library called Accelerate, which will compile array-based code down to GPU code to run directly on a, a graphics card. And the, the amount of latitude that the compiler can take in how it optimizes and transforms your code is very important in those scenarios. Because what actually gets compiled down may be a set of instructions that are so different from what you wrote in the code that you might not even recognize it. You might look at the code and say, wow, that's just black magic, how it got from my source code to this executable code. Whereas in C, you can actually read the assembly code and roughly see how your C code line by line translated into that assembly code. Okay. So on that note, what are some of your favorite features about the Haskell programming language? Um, well, it depends on what... Uh, what area you're asking me. Personally, one of my favorite features is how closely it, it ties into mathematics. And so you, mathematics, I'm learning now, has a lot of beauty in it. And one of the fun things about Haskell is it gives you a playground to actually take these mathematical concepts and play with them in code and, and then see how they work out in actual programs. In more commercial programming, I would say one of my favorite aspects of Haskell is that thing I mentioned earlier where when you do heavy refactoring in Haskell, the type system guides you toward correctness. Uh, just the other day, I rewrote one of our core systems. And it was a pretty huge rewrite. It took me maybe, I think, 60 hours to get that rewrite done. And I just utterly blew the code away. I took all the code, I commented it out. Every single line was commented out, just so it would compile again. I, I re had rewritten it all, and now I had to bring it back step by step by uncommenting the code, getting it to compile, uncommenting more code, getting it to compile. If it hadn't been for Haskell's type system guiding me along the way to make sure that I had covered all my bases, that I had made all the types match up again, I'm not sure that that refactoring job could have been completed in nearly as short a time. And, it, and it's ready to go into production actually very soon now. We're looking for really result-driven metrics like what what can we tell people about Haskell that might make them have their all right that's enough proof that I should check this out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well I've had several other refactoring experiences like that one that I just mentioned there was one where the git library was reading git it was reading um, path names out of git objects and I didn't know that path names and git objects are just raw bytes and I really can't interpret those bytes in any way 
I'm supposed to just pass them along. I had been interpreting them as UTF-8. So what I was finding then is that U Unicode path names from one operating system, if they got committed to a repository and cloned onto another operating system, I was reading them incorrectly. So I had a core data type text to represent the Unicode path name, and I needed to just change that path name type to byte string so that it would be a raw, a raw uh, collection of bytes. All I had to do in Haskell was make that change and fix all the compiler errors. And that's it. I was done. It maybe took me six hours to get that refact. And that was a, not a minor refactoring because that reached out and touched all of the code that I had written that was making uh, uh, assumptions about the encoding of path names. But because of the type system, it was very mechanical, very straightforward how to, how to propagate that refactoring out through the rest of my code. And it went into production just days later. Uh, that's how much confidence I had in it because of the type system. So I, I, as much as I like, as much as I've said I like Haskell's performance and efficiency gains, I think I like mo more than anything else the correctness. The, 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 it's not 100% correctness, but there's enough strong correctness guarantees there that it's very, very valuable. Like for me, my, the research I'm coming across, you know, people either they know about Haskell and are emphatically in love with it, or they're not really, they've heard of it and they've heard it's hard. So they don't want to go down that path. And other people haven't even heard of it at all. And some people think it's kind of a flash in the pan, even though it's been around for a while, it's kind mm -hmm. of that math language. And it's not going to have the type of business impact that programmers like you have already started to see. Mm -hmm. So if there's something more we can talk along the lines of that business impact where it's changing the way, or it could potentially improve the way people are doing things in other domains. Hmm. Well, thinking back on some of the teams I've been in, I spent, I spent many years working at Borland on their C++ compiler. And we, at the time, had been writing the IDE in C++. Because, I mean, that's the language we were writing the compiler for. It seemed only natural that we would use our own compiler to write the IDE. And one of the things um, that C++ sort of became a detriment for us in that particular way is that several engineers that we had there had very different ideas of what good C++ looked like. So there would be some engineers who really loved implicit conversions and overloaded operators and basically all this magic happening behind the scenes and visibly when you would write your code. Another group of engineers loved the object-oriented paradigm and they were really big on inheritance and object polymorphism and these types of ideas. And then a third group was uh, very big into templates and all template-driven interfaces. And what ended up happening was the code got uh, there was enough of a polyglot effect that these very, very different paradigms sort of all sort of meshing together into this large, large code base that in the end made it unmaintainable. And that IDE code base did not live for very many years because if you came in as a new engineer, it was just very hard to understand what the code was doing unless you were of the mindset of the type of person that had written that code. With Haskell... It's the, the abstraction, there are a lot of capacities there for abstraction, for writing, in, um, for making use of concepts that save you from writing a lot of code, but you still have a lot of the explicitness of languages like C where you can look at a page of code and know what that code is saying. Um, looking at a page of C++ code, depending on the engineer who wrote it, that page of C++ code can mean something completely different from what you think it means unless you understand the context of all the declarations and types outside of your view that give meaning to that code. And in Haskell, you get, you get some of the explicitness back from a language like C, but you get the high-level abstractions and a lot of the, the, the conciseness that those abstractions give you of languages like C++ so that for teams of engineers... If you have architected a large thing in Haskell and you have a new engineer come into your code and you want him to make some change, I think there are a lot of benefits for the corporation in terms of, yes, it's hard for that engineer to get up to speed in Haskell perhaps, but once he is, it's not as hard for him to get up to speed with your application. 
with the thing that you've written. I, I know several companies that have had multi hundred thousand line apps, maybe even getting close to several million line apps that after a certain amount of time and changeover of the engineers who wrote those apps just have to rewrite it because it has now become complex enough and difficult to understand enough from the small, um, from the small perspective. In, in other words, there's nobody in the company left who, who understands the whole big picture that the only way to deal with the complexity of the abstractions in that code is to just rewrite it. And I think what Haskell does is that as the, pro, as the project gets larger, as the number of engineers on the project gets larger, and as turnover happens as it inevitably will, the, the curve toward unmaintainability, in, order, in, in other words, the technical debt that you accrue over time is smaller. It's still there, of course, as it will be with any project, but I definitely think that it's smaller. And I see that in our own team. We have a very small team, but a lot of people are working on code that I've, I don't get to see as they write it. I don't, you know, the, I don't see a huge documentation telling me how to read it and all the things that it does. But I can jump into that code base and make some kind of sense out of it, enough to make the changes I need to make without having to go through as much difficulty. So let's say that Haskell's cost is an upfront cost with a long payment, uh, payoff over time. Whereas other languages, it's very easy to say that they have an incredibly small upfront cost, but you keep paying over time. And I think that, I think, I, I mean, like I've heard other people say, it's a zero sum game. Nothing is going to ever make programming completely easy. There will always be a cost in terms of manpower, money, uh, mental effort. It's just where you spend the cost. So Haskell is front loading a lot of that effort. So that when you do in your company get a group of strong Haskell engineers, I think that they can get a lot more done and they will be, a lot, they will a, they will be able to field more complex pro problems over a span of time than a group working in some other language. Could you touch upon some of the specific things FP Complete is doing to facilitate that group mindset you just referenced? Well, we're trying to give them tools so that that group does not have to worry about infrastructure as much. They can just focus on code. They can come into the IDE that we're developing, and we will have all the packages built that they need to, to work with. We give them a nice, clean, consistent set of packages that we know work together with our stackage environment. Uh, we can deploy their code to Amazon for them. A lot of the, a lot of the IT level type things that engineers inevitably have to deal with, we're trying to take that out of the equation for them so that they can just focus on writing code. Are there any other features in our IDE that are going to be specifically helpful to group management like that? Well, um, when, a, when an engineer is coming in to read code that somebody else wrote, so say he goes into a file that he's never been in before, and the other, the other people on his team wrote it, but he needs to understand it to some degree relatively quickly, uh, you have Haskell's type system, of course, helping you. The Haskell types define what the program really can do. It gives constraints to, to um, what it's able to do and, and a lot of meaning as to what the, what the functions are going to be doing. And our IDE gives ways of inspecting those types very easily so that you can, you're reading some code and you're wondering, well, what's the type of this? What does this do? And you can just click on the identifier and it'll give you the type. You can drag a, a highlight over a region and we'll give you the type of that region. So we give you some code inspection facilities that make it easier to digest code that you may not have any knowledge of. You can look up documentation right then and there, either in uh, Hugel or in future we'll be, we'll be able to uh, show you project specific documentation as well. So it's that code browsing effect that a lot of other IDEs have given for other languages that I think in Haskell start becoming uniquely powerful because of how deep the type system is integrated into the Haskell mindset and how Haskell code works. Do you have any future projects in mind on your from personal projects that you're excited about with Haskell? Well, um, I, I wrote an accounting program in C++ that is out in the open source community called Ledger. And there is a Haskell port to Ledger right now uh, called HLedger, which a friend of mine works on. And one thing I would like to do is I'm interested in taking some of the things that the C++ version of Ledger has that HLedger doesn't yet and, and porting those over into Haskell. Because as, I, as I'm learning Haskell and, and math, of course, by way of Haskell, I'm seeing how much of what I did in Ledger 
were already solved problems. There are, they, they have names, you know, they have, they have proofs and theorems relating to them that I didn't take advantage of any of those things because I didn't know the math behind what I was doing. I didn't know the computer science behind what I was doing. So there are faster, better, more efficient ways of doing some of the things that I did in C++. And now I can take advantage of that in Haskell because there are libraries already built by other people who have, the, who have uh, a firm grasp of these, these abstractions, and I can just make use of those libraries to create something which is much, much smaller in terms of lines of code, yet just as uh, featureful, if not more so, than what I had achieved in C++. I would like to also say how great the community is around Haskell. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I've worked in a lot of other languages, so I've gotten to know many different language uh, programming communities. And I would have to say that the caliber and helpfulness of people in the Haskell community is one of the things that kept me going. Uh, even when Haskell was very hard, very difficult, and I was thinking about giving up on it, the, the people were so fun to hang out around. And a lot of them are quite admirable. So I would look up to them and think, I want to know what this person knows. I want to at least learn Haskell well enough that what he's saying doesn't sound completely bizarre and, and mysterious to me. And by, by keeping to that, I did reach that point where I could appreciate a lot more of what they had to offer. And I just realized w how much quality there is in the Haskell world at the moment. So for that alone, I, w I recommend a lot of my engineer friends to it. Because I know a lot of programmers that love programming, have a lot of fun programming. And I think that they could have even more fun over on the Haskell side of things because of the, some, uh, some of the unique qualities that are there. Well, great. Thank you so much. really appreciate your time with us. Oh, you're welcome, and Natalia.